again, having heard Carolyn's long talk and the speaker putting his marker down that we said on how important this issue is, do we have it right that it's as dire as all that? Ms. Britton's presentation could really uh, be, be seen as a wake-up call. Many people in the room are already awake, but for the remainder of the state, having said how serious the problem is, Chief, Mr. Chairman, do you think the problem is as dire as she and others have been? Well, yes. When you, when you talk about an issue, hello. Hello. <laughs> Uh, as important as water and where we have to be, where we are today, where we have to be, uh, the seriousness of it cannot be questioned, Evan. And going through, you know, it's been 15 years, I believe, since SB1 was passed. And the roadmap of, of developing the water resource to get our state for the next 50 years. Um, It is so important to us because you have to get down to the nitty gritty, folks. The nitty gritty is simply this. You cannot have a functional society without water resource. Can't do it. It's never been done in the history of the planet Earth. And while that might be a little bit extreme thinking for some of us here today, that's the truth. That's where we're at. If we know that we're going to have population X and we're going to have the growth, infrastructure growth and such to meet that population needs in this type of society, you got to have water. Senator, we're conditioned to hearing that every election is the most important election of our lifetime and every issue, yeah, I hear the same thing. And every issue is the most important issue out there. Um, but this one you really believe is. I usually term it in the nature of infrastructure. And because as we're, as the speaker mentioned so astutely earlier, the rapid growth in the population, the diversity of our, of our state, the large breadth of Texas, the 254 counties, the fact is, is we have to deal with our infrastructure issues. And as we grow in population, you asked the word question to the Chairman Ritter of dire, and I might reserve from using the word dire but I think the terms critical, vital, important, and you have to be forward thinking. I was thinking about it on my drive over here from Katie this morning, beautiful morning, and, and in part, water reminds me of a, a little story. I have, those of you that may not realize, I have a seven, a four, and a four-year-old. And typically, as I put my kids to bed, they do one thing, that this little story that I was thinking about on the way over here. As a father put his kids to bed, the little boy, the four-year-old, said from afar, from the bedroom a few minutes later, Daddy, 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 yes, son, I'm thirsty. And Dad said, just go to bed. A few minutes later, Daddy, 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 yes, son, I'm thirsty. He said, go to bed. If I hear you again, I'm going to spank you. So then about that time, lo and behold, guess what happened a few minutes later? The kid says, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Yes, what is it now? When you come up to spank me, can you bring me some water? <laughs> and the point of that is we as society are not much different from my four-year-old children. So, well, we could have solved the problem, just have a drink of water before we go to bed. But we did not. We wait too long. And so, right. you know, it, is it dire? No, but is it something that's really important? Yes, and one thing that I think is so critical is if we're going to create enough jobs and economic opportunities for this state and for the people of this state, we have to make sure that we have the infrastructure, the water there, because if we do not, we're gonna start having jobs leaving this state or not coming to this state. Right. And as the speaker mentioned, when you have a major uh, business that wants to leave the home of the hub of San Antonio and go to the desert because of water, you got a problem. There's a problem with that. Right. Uh, Senator, I hear you when you say we have no choice but to deal with it, that we've waited too long to deal with it, but I wonder why you think that the legislature has any more of a stomach this time than they've apparently not had in previous sessions. This is not a new problem. Yes, we've come out of the worst one-year drought in the history of Texas. Right. And yes, the losses to ag and other aspects of our business and environment have been significant, and we know what the projections out are, but the reality is these are not new problems. We've had a water problem for some time, and yet we haven't had the stomach to deal with it budgetarily or politically previously. Why should we be any more optimistic that you all have the stomach to deal with it 
next time. Oh, if I alluded that we had the stomach, I, I was misjudged uh, because, you know, the, the fact is, is with all the issues are important. And at the end of any given legislative session, when you're only there 140 days, the question is what rises to the top? Right. And when you have such a turnover of significant numbers in the Senate and the House, what is the direction of the membership? And what right. is that issue? But I do think on the hills that you mentioned of the drought, as well as leadership, and members like Chairman Ritter or the Speaker or many others that talk about the need that we have to solve these problems, but we don't have to solve them all today. Right. We need to incrementally begin to solve these problems over time. We don't have a $53 billion Well, they're too large today. to, so, so, you, you to cannot, solve on You in, absolutely cannot. On one bite. Let, let me interject something yes, on this. It, 2011, for the first time in my life, every part of Texas got affected. Uh, I see David Montaigne from the Sabine River Authority right here. East Texas, we got affected. We've never had that. Yep. Uh, people all over this state, it hit us. While some of us have been preaching that, you know, droughts can happen and they're going to happen and population growth is going to get us, it hit us in East Texas for the first time. Right. The realization it just hit us like the two before, which I'm in the lumber business, so I'm a very uh, comfortable with saying this right between the eyes. Uh, and uh, personally, I've gone from having zero members of the Texas House and the Senate talking to me about solving this problem to a whole lot of them in both the House and the Senate yep. serious, you know, talking to us. Seriously, it's time to get this done. So uh, uh, this drought, did it, it's changed attitudes big. Okay. Very big. So, so we, we, maybe we have a little bit more stomach than we've had in the last couple of sessions, and maybe present circumstances give us a little bit more will. Well, but we the reality is, this is a legislature. Well, so. this is the point. <laughs> I'm going to be optimistic on the on the on the inclination part, but I'm also right. realistic about the wallet part. Right? We have will, but do we have wallet? We know what happened in the last legislative session. We had a shortfall of anywhere from 15 billion dollars north, depending upon how you choose to quantify it. And going into the next session. While we're more optimistic about sales tax collections and the right. possibility of That's not right. having a shortfall on this, on, of the sort that we had last time, or maybe not even one at all, we have a governor who has said, and I think he is not here, so we can talk about him. We have a governor who has said not only no new taxes, but no tax increases on existing taxes and no fees, and we don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. Anything we do in the area of water is going to run afoul, in theory, of the governor's belief that we have a spending problem. So. Mr. Chairman, how do you wire around that as your mandate going into the session, not to spend? Well, every session the legislature has priorities they have to make. And as long as I can remember, even before I'm in the legislature, there has always been a wish list a lot bigger than what our budget could ever do. Right. Uh, now, me personally, I don't remember the governor I don't remember reading it or hearing him saying anything about no fees. So maybe, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Uh, well, somebody tweet I, I, that and then let okay. us know when they tweet okay. back, actually. Uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> we'll give him something to do today. Yeah. Um, but here's what I'm being told. The legislature... He's having a hard morning. It's not even 10 o'clock, isn't it? Oh, we're having fun. Yeah. Here's... The members that are talking to me are wanting to get it done. Uh, and um, whether, you know, my prayer, ladies and gentlemen, my prayer is that we come um, start in January and we get to working in the, the appropriations and Senate Finance Committee says, okay, we got this much seed capital we can work with. Um, then we will have the ability to hopefully do something that doesn't have as big a fee burden or tax burden on the people of Texas to generate the funds we need. And that's, you, that's you, you've point. wanted to go, the, I want to talk in a moment, I want to go okay. to Senator Hager now, but I want to come back to your, you've had one specific TAP fee uh, proposal that you have uh, attempted in the past. I want to talk about that and maybe some other things you have up your sleeve with regard to revenue. But Senator, let me ask you, mm -hmm. the Senate, as you know, right. is fixing to be more conservative by a factor of maybe 10 in this next session with the replacement of of Senator Harris, Senator Shapiro, Senator Ogden, Senator Wentworth, um, uh, Senator Jackson, still possibly Senator Davis. We know that it's either going to be five or six new members 
who are not only more conservative, but significantly more conservative than the people they're replacing. So I don't imagine a Senate with a particular interest in just spending wildly. So can you give us a perspective on, on revenue and whether there's going to be an appetite to spend, even with the knowledge that that spending is as a hedge against having to spend more later? What, no, what do you think? No, that, that, that's a great question. I, I always look at it from this vantage point is what, what does the membership readily available want to do or willing to do? Right. And I would share with, with Alan's comments that there is a much greater recognition, and that's your question. Recognition yeah. doesn't equate to actually moving the ball, right. no pun sitting here looking at the football field, moving the ball down, advancing it towards the other goal line. But I do think that when people are talking in their communities and they understand the potential of, of losing jobs, losing businesses, losing kind of the momentum that Texas has had, however you want to phrase it, over the last several years in economic development, that's that's very real. So that's I, the I argument, think, Senator, is the economic least, development we've enjoyed over the last few years is at risk if we don't do something. At least I think it is. When you when you talk oh, about the numbers of talking about a record a record drought and push this out to 2050, 2060, right. and you start talking about the magnitude of the numbers. Yeah. But 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 scale back again, the sky's not falling. We we had a drought last year that brings recognition. But then now let's move it somewhere in between and say, okay, how do we come up with a plan that incrementally gets this done? Can I say that the Senate or the House readily has an appetite for A, B, C, or D when it comes to fees or taxes or right. a use of the rainy day fund? I don't think that I can say that right here today. Although, you know, I, Senator, that's what's, what's come up is whether a right. one-time expenditure from the rainy day fund, which might actually hit the narrow strip that even conservatives on the budget might be willing to accept. A one-time expenditure out of the rainy day fund might be a way to jumpstart this. Is that something you're I looking I at? I would say, I would actually, what you said, a jumpstart. I think that yeah, would be the, very the more, accurate. The more seed capital you can put into it, the, the shorter the timeline, uh, the quicker you can do your right. your uh, total project. So we can show the two of you, from the Senate perspective and the House perspective, open to the idea of using on a one-time basis funds from the rainy day fund to help us get the water plan started. Oh, we'll look at anything. I've, I've been out there talking about it in my district, yeah. you know, so I mean, I've actively talked about it, but I also say not just when we talk about water infrastructure, but also transportation infrastructure. Right. And, and reason be that in significant part because of where I live, western right. part outside of Houston, but then also take the western part of my district where it's booming in the Eagleford Shell area yeah. and the need for transportation out there for state and of right. county okay. roads. And the, the, and, and the water is very similar. Exactly. Problem to both water infrastructure, infrastructure issues on some we're, levels. We're behind the curve. And if you don't have them, you don't look to the future. And population growth have. is destiny as far as it's coming. It's correct. They're issues. coming. Senator, what mechanisms for, uh, for generating revenue to pay for some of this stuff are you unwilling to consider? Under no circumstances, you will consider what sources of revenue. Wow, that's, a, that's always a tough question. I, I always try to step back from saying that anything and everything is either on the table or off the table. So taxes are, are taxes that, on the table? Oh, they might be on the table. Now, whether I'll consider them is another issue. Um, I might go sit at another table. Um, but, that, but, that, but that's the question you're have asking. You, have, you, have you signed the governor's budget compact? I don't believe in compacts and pledges and all that. You know my, this my, is on the my, record, right? Yeah, I understand yeah. it is. I guess it's uh, too late for you my, to get a primary opponent. You never know. Uh, anything can happen. Divine intervention. You never know. It could be a mighty write-in candidate. Uh, but the fact is, is I've always said, my pledge is to people of Senate District 18. Yeah. That's who my And what are you hearing from them with regard to revenue? What I hear from them from revenue is that they don't want an increase in any type of revenue, but they want us to solve the problem. Right. And it's kind of okay. like, uh, that's the reason I started out kind of jokingly yeah. with my son, my four-year-old, Daddy, Daddy, I'm thirsty. Um, right. He hasn't ever said, spank, bring me some water when you come to spank me. But, um, you know, the fact is, is I think the public, they just want us to solve the problem. Right. They don't care that, how. That, Representative, that, the, pub, that, the public often wants something but does not want to do what's necessary to do the thing they want. That's correct. That, and that's not just in water issue. Right. Uh, it's, it's pretty much across the board. That's right. Um, and what I'm hearing all over the state of Texas is pretty much the same thing. This is an important issue. We want to solve, but at the same time, 
don't raise my taxes. Solve it for nothing. You know, nothing uh, this. So I would have to answer your question. I will look at anything as long as I don't have to pay for all $53 billion out of my pocket. Yeah, but you'd which be, couldn't do anything. But you'd be willing to pay for some, potentially. Yes. I, I, so I, I'm, I'm being open about everything, being realistic about it, about the whole, uh, the whole issue, the whole broad picture. And, you know, I, I think the, the title of this, this phase was, uh, can the legislature solve, solve the problem? The problem. Mm -hmm. And if you were to directly ask me that question, I would tell you, no, the legislature can't solve this problem all by itself. At least not alone. That's, That's right. correct. That's right. We have certain, it's, this is, this is why Senate Bill 1 is, is such a great plan. Uh, Governor Bullock and Laney and Buster Brown and everybody that was involved in it, Kip Averett, um, it actually is, gives the ability of the state to work together united in a perpetual plan that is ongoing uh, to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And it's not me or Glenn Hager or Senator Zaffarini telling right. everybody this is what you're going to do. It starts from the local entities up. It's always being redeveloped and such. It's, it's, it's really a great idea. So great the, idea, the idea that somehow you all are going to wave your wands and solve the problem completely. We no. understand it's going to take the involvement of counties that's and cities. Right. And, that, that, that's absolutely right. And also tied to this is the fact that each one of us as citizens of this great state working with our own entity have to make the decisions with our, when our own entities, our local entities, with our local leaders, have to make those hard decisions that we're going to stand up and do these projects and such. Uh, you heard the speaker earlier talk about in earlier history where San Antonio uh, decided the local citizens not to do a project, and USAA said, well, if we're not going to have the water resource, we're gone. Well, it takes we the people, it takes the local entities, and it takes the state in the bill in the 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 part that they need to play. And right yeah. now the part that we need to play is in developing the sun funding source to keep this plan, this roadmap going. Well let, 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 let's get to that. So I mentioned a tap fee proposal that you had put forward previously, not the only proposal you'd put forward. But I wonder if you would explain that, why you thought that was a good idea and whether we can expect for you to bring <laughs> that back before the legislature again in the eighty third session. Okay, well, first I got to go to what our ideals were. And, and let me, ladies and gentlemen, there have been people working on this since, I know, since 1996, uh, and, and several attempts of, um, of funding sources. Um, our committee, we tried to set some parameters of what we wanted to do as far as looking at a, a defined benefit, a defined fund. And what we did not want to do was punish any one industry. We didn't want to make any one industry uh, non-competitive because of uh, any taxes, fees, rates, or whatever. The emphasis is always on keeping the state of Texas competitive. If you can't provide uh, water resource or any resource like that at a competitive prices, then you no longer make your state uh, ideal, and you will, lose, you will lose people. They'll go to Louisiana or somewhere else. The other thing you, what we looked at was what, how could we spread the burden if there was a burden as a fee, tax, whatever you find, whatever you want to call it, how do we spread that burden amongst as many uh, Texans and as, amongst the, uh, as many entities as possible where uh, the burden was as least as possible. Uh, and we looked at all kind of different issues, uh, different plans and such, uh, and basically the one we felt like could have uh, the best oversight, you really knew where, uh, who was being affected, who was not being affected, uh, and, and such, uh, was a tap fee. Uh, and basically what we did was try to establish, uh, extrapolate, okay, if we needed $26.9 billion over such, and in the, in the critical path of the projects being built X amount of time, you'd probably need this or that, and through modeling that the Water Development Board does, 
we came up with, if we could find half a billion dollars, for lack of better terms, Senator Hager will say we stole it uh, from one fund, which we, that's what the game was. We were going to take half a billion dollars and extrapolating that, a tap fee would have been about, if I remember right, $3.30 to $3.50 a year for residential. And for my retail operations, it would have been about $50 or $60 a year, and, and commercial would have been $100, $150, something like that. Um, we had a starting point, and we were looking for an ending point. And of course, the ending point depends on how the projects go and the fund revolves back. And the ending was somewhere around 20 years, if I remember right. But all this, you know, these, these numbers can change as uh, uh, time goes by. How much money do you think you could put into the kitty through that tap fee? Oh, we would end it up, it would end up doing the $26.9 billion worth of projects. Over, over that period? Over, it might have been 22 years right. or whatever, 25 years. Um, Doesn't seem like an enormous burden at those low numbers well, annually. It, so why was the legislature it, it, not racing to endorse or embrace your plan? Because we're just they weren't ready to take that kind of bite out of the apple. Right, Senator, that's not a very big bite. That's a nibble at best. If we're not looking at nibbles, what, what makes you any more optimistic about being able to come up with some kind of a creative plan? I and were you? I should ask, were you for the right, right. chairman's plan? No, I never I'm, went I'm, to the Senate. He's got to get it to us. Well, first. but, 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 but we, I know no, you didn't I, get it. In I, I, I kind of, I had kind of half a polite dodge right. of the question. Are you for it in the abstract? <laughs> Evan, no, no. back up. We couldn't get it out of the house. Either. I understand right. that, right. but I'm That's still right. asking the senator: Would you be for something what, like what the chairman just described? I'm, I'm more than willing to look at. It. I have, I haven't looked at the details of his plan. Yeah. To tell you the truth, yeah. I haven't looked at the whole details, the runs, the estimates, the projections of what it would be today, tomorrow, 10 years and 15 years. Right. And so since it didn't get to us or have a significant amount of movement, I didn't have to pour through. Of course, if you can get half of the $53 billion over a period of time by asking individuals in the state to pay about three bucks a year, as painful solutions go, that one seems reasonably painless. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, it's 2012, it soon will be 2013. We are, uh, we're working with the Water Development Board and stakeholders and uh, turning over rocks again and, yep. and trying to clarify and understand in the state water plan, you have water infrastructure fund, you got state participation plan, and uh, wow, there's a lot of variables in this. Uh, subsidy, do we want to do 1%, 2% subsidy? Do we have to, in our pro forma, look at it because you're, you know, we're talking about a long time and total build out. Uh, what happens if the rates move up? If the rates move up, then we, we do have, in my opinion, have to look at a higher subsidy than 1%. Yeah. Uh, so you have to take all this in consideration and then you have to extrapolate the numbers by modeling to come up with what kind of seed capital you want. Or, uh, you know, just do your basic math. If, you want to do it in 20, 25 years, and it takes $26.9 billion, then there's how much you need to put in uh, every biennium. Uh, there's, there's ways to look at it. The important thing to me is how do you do it where you spread that burden, if there is required a fee tax, fine, or whatever you want to call it, how do you spread that burden around as many of us, we the people in Texas, whether it's residents, uh, um, or businesses. Businesses. Right. Uh, how do you do that where it does not put a burden that uh, becomes uh, tough for them to be in business? How do you do it where our state is competitive, where we will continue to attract businesses right. and such? Let me tell you, Texas isn't the only state doing this, by the way. Right. You look across this nation, many other states that are being proactive are saying, we've got to have water resource developed for the next 50 to 100 years so we can be in the game. In order to stay competitive, and in fact, to Carolyn Britton's presentation, the cost of doing nothing is far in excess over oh, time of the cost right. of but doing those, something. Those are, those are questions that businesses are really starting to ask when Themselves. they start looking here per, because per, they, per they the talk speakers. about transportation of whether it's water goods and electrical prices. Per, per the speaker's point. That's exactly. Right. They talk and ask those questions. Right. Now, of course, I want to back away from water for one second before diving 
right back into the center of it and say that we occasionally hear the same thing about public education. You know, That's well, right. we don't That's have a competitive right. public education system, we're That's never right. going to attract business. If we don't adequately provide for higher education, and we know that the state share of right. funding of higher ed has precipitously fallen reduced. over the last 20 years, how are we going to prepare the workforce for, the, you know, to, for us to be a competitive state going forward? We know that we have a question on immigration policy and right. the change right. in the population, and what are we going to do to confront that issue in a way that's both fair but also right. follows the law and is right. proactive about what's coming down the, the next 10 or 15 years. I mean, we have all these issues, we could say the exact same things about that we just that's said. Right. So that's it right. gets back to what the speaker said, and that's priorities. Mm -hmm. Where do you, how can you sell water as a greater priority than public ed or higher ed or health care or immigration right. because the amount of money is finite even though the number of challenges we have is infinite? That's right. What do, no, what do you I mean, do about that? No, you said the exact point that I try to explain that the legislative process is really a funnel. And Senator Zaffarini, Representative Isaac, Ritter, we all put our stuff at the top of the funnel, and in 140 days, it comes down to a small part, doesn't it, Senator? Yeah. That's right. And the question is, what's going to get through the bottom? Some things and what, will and some things won't. And, and, and I wanted to make the point, which you said it before I did, all of those things are in there. Yep. And all of those are important. And so really, last year's drought does make a highlight, a bolding, if you take the yeah. highlighter out and strike water, much more than it has in the past. It gives it a greater likelihood of happening. A significant right. greater likelihood. Yeah. While you were driving in from Katy this morning, Senator, Andy Sansom made a few opening remarks, and one of the things he said was, we seem to have the belief in this water plan, whatever the funding source ends up being, that we can build our way out of the problem. There are people who will look at the state water plan, well-intentioned, Ms. Britton, and we respect the work of the Water Development Board, but they say we're not even sure that we have the right plan under current circumstances. Is really the best way to solve this problem to go build a whole bunch of reservoirs, to acquire a whole bunch of right away, to do what would be required? Is it an engineering solution, or are there maybe other things that have come online since the plan was first written, better use of technology, or right. desal plants and the like, a better use and a more efficient use of resources than simply building reservoirs. That's right. Do you have That's a point right. of view about whether, because again, we fight about how much money it's going to cost and how are we going to implement this plan, but there are some people in this room, I dare say, who don't even think we have the right plan, whatever the cost is. No, I, I think that's a very good question because one of the things I've been talking about for several years now is, and the question I think was asked of Carolyn earlier about the prioritization. And I think the last thing was if people come wanting to borrow the money, then there's a prioritization because what yeah. are those priorities? And I do think those priorities change over time, and, and your point is very, very correct. If uh, we want to talk about San Antonio, just because the speaker was here and that's kind of fresh on mind, if we talk about building a reservoir, well, in a way, that was a great idea a long time ago. The voters didn't approve it, didn't want to do it, they didn't go in that direction. But San Antonio has kind of been meeting their needs in some other places. Well, in you fact, know, they, they've been one of the leaders among metropolitan areas in helping to stem the problem that they've had through other but means. But in part That's because right. they, they had were no not choice. able to build a reservoir. Right. That so was they part were, of the stimulus to change the wall. a right. different direction. Right. And as we look to 22% increase in needs in the next several in the next several decades, but we also have to talk about well, we have 10% reduction in our reservoirs because of silt and fill. So yeah. in other words, the capacity is getting less over time. So my point is, is will we have more reservoirs? Yes, I think. But are we going to build a bunch of reservoirs? Because the timeline to build them takes forever. Yeah. Where, you know, uh, here not too long ago, talking about different ideas and different things. And when we look at storing water underground versus on top, right. you don't quite lose as much water underground as you do on top, but yeah. it has to be economic and feasible. Do we have D cell? Do we have brackish that become more economically feasible? Yeah. And that's part of the question. Did we have a lot of, I think the question earlier was agriculture didn't have some of its needs met, and yes, yeah. but it's unfeasible to get the water there. Right, and but, so, we, but over time, technology may make things possible that are not possible. But yeah. even more so, not I possible. think, you know, the, there's an issue when I go to one of my local communities and I talk to the city manager and I say, well, what have you been doing? Tell me about your day. What, what, what's going on in the, in the community? Well, I've been out putting posters to ask for voluntary reduction in water use last year. Why? Because we were significantly in a drought. I said, oh, well, voluntarily, we haven't put in mandatory measures. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Well, they don't want to do that because they don't want to take the pressure. Right. And I understand that, but also part of the reason I think, and I didn't ask the question, well, there's also a stream of revenue. And not to knock that, yeah. but there's not a high incentive is my point 
that even several years ago in Katy, where I live, we live on the Gulf Coast, you get a lot of rain, Tropical Storm Allison came through a decade or more ago, and I've said this story before, where I got up early in the morning to go to the farm because I knew I had issues when that much rain fell on our farm. As I was driving through the town I live in, my rain gauge was so full, I had no clue how much it rained. I knew it rained more than six inches. Why? Because it was full. That's right. all it could hold. Right. The ditches were full. There was water everywhere. Drove through town, and I had three of my neighbors still using their sprinkler systems that morning. They are out there just a going. Right. Now, it doesn't mean that we as a legislature need to mandate rain gauges to cut off sprinkler systems, but there's a problem with Although that. I'm intrigued by the idea, though. Yeah. I, I, I confess. Uh, okay. Chairman, let me ask you the same thing I asked the senator. Do we have the right plan? Leaving aside the cost and the mechanism for paying for it, do we have the right plan? But, Evan, I have to answer that, that that's kind of in the eyes of the beholder. My job, Glenn's job, Senator Zaffarina, we have to, we have to work under the, under the plan that we have. Uh, Why? Because that's the law, and that's what the plan says. Now. You also have to realize... Wait, 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 let me stop you. Really? If we, if we think we have the wrong plan, we're stuck with it? No, we can change it. No, no, no. That's, we don't need to go... But it's a regionally driven it, plan. It's a regional plan, and the plan does change. And the point I was trying to make is yeah. the markets, it will change as local entities, right. uh, as, as each region wants to change it, instead uh, uh, for us in the legislature to start making... Um, decisions and statutes mandating this that we need right. to be admittedly real careful. Admittedly subjective yeah, decisions. Yeah, we need like. to be real careful right. about that because, uh, like, I, I'm one that believes that desal is going to be uh, uh, a very big part of solving our our problem over the years. Yeah. Right now, it's not. It's going to be very limited because of the cost factor. But technology may bring the cost. Yeah, down. Yeah, I think technology will help bring the cost down. I think that uh, you'll see new technology in just in fracking uh, procedures that are going to reduce the use of groundwater use in fracking. Uh, all these new innovations that, that will be coming along. And as they do, they will be taken into the water plant and, that, and that's the market changing and yeah. working right. Uh, I think the legislature needs to add the tools in the toolbox as they need to. For one, I think in, in, in this session we'll be looking at it. Do we need to take steps related to what Senator Hager was t talking about in conservation measures more than we do now? Um, I, want, I want to ask about that. And, and, and this is something that's very difficult for the legislature to do because we you know, we're Texans. We believe in local control. We like local. We like yeah, local control. Yeah, you know, if we, if, you know, if right. somebody's going to whip you up, we want the local boys to do it. <laughs> well, but, but so, so to that point, two quick ones before we open it up for questions. So on the local control question, Senator makes the point that, you know, what are you going to do with a local community that doesn't have, in effect, adequate restrictions on watering? You know, we know that Midland and Odessa are among the communities in the state that have been hardest hit by the drought, and they've been the most ardent about putting restrictions on watering and other uses of water in, in effect. But there are communities that have not been nearly as serious about That's right. conservation as, as, as they have. We are a state that likes to turn over the control of such things to communities. So what, what do we do about that? Is the, do we just have to shrug our shoulders and go, oh well? Or can we actually do something from the state level, even if it's not a mandate, Senator? I, I think you have to seriously look at, and I haven't found that actually silver bullet or golden goose that has that right answer, but I will say that I do not believe that it's just, here's a hammer and beat you over the head. Yeah. You municipality have to do this. Because I just don't think it works effectively in every community. They're all a little bit different. Yep. But I do think that as we go forward with water plans and we talk about funding infrastructure, you can also put into play incentives. And I think incentives are real drivers. Yep. And I think education is a real driver that if communities, people, as they're putting in their yards, you know, the, the landscaping industry, oh, we don't want you to cut off the water. Right. Because that's a business. Well, there's a point to that. But you can also put certain types of plants versus here that don't require the same need. Indeed. You know, we're, we're, we're not Michigan. It's not cool here. So you're we're not, not going to so have we're not Michigan. We're not Michigan. Oh. So you're not going to have the same beautiful that's flowers it. that you are up in Colorado in the spring. Right. Let's not be them. Yeah. But let's make sure people understand 
They can have a nice yard, right. but they can't have the same quality. Representative, you, you agree? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and you know, here in Texas, we've had cities uh, like, like Dallas, Texas, that has been, and I'll just say it, kind enough to work with other cities and give neighboring cities some of their water to help them through tough times. But, you know, it's kind of a, a strange or a, a horrible thought to think if I'm the city of Dallas and I'm giving the neighboring city water and then I have to turn the conservation knob on them, my citizens' folks and, uh, and, and tell them they can't use water their lawn and all that, but the one we let bar water is not doing the same. Well, that's not right. Yep. That's just not right. So yeah. uh, this is something that, that uh, I hope that, that we get to address. And, and if the legislature needs to step in and do something to help these entities, yep. uh, I'm all for it. But I'm not for it if it's not needed, yeah. that the tools are already there. Uh, one more thing that Brother Sanson was preaching about this morning, and I've heard him preach about it on other occasions, is the amount of water that is lost as a consequence of leaky right. storage facilities. Right. In fact, I've heard Andy say right. that in some counties, 30, 40 percent of the water ends up being wasted because storage facilities are That's inadequately right. Right. Uh, put together. They're old. They need to be re refitted. I'm no genius on this stuff, but it seems to me that the cost of those facilities being repaired or upgraded is probably quite a lot less than some of the other solutions that we'd be looking at. And if that much water is being lost, why is that not the kind of ex proactive expenditure that the legislature would want to look at as a way to get at solving the problem less expensively, Senator? I, I think it is. I was going to make a point earlier, but I got off. We talk about the $53 billion, but if then you also add in wastewater treatment facilities, you add in all the other integral needs, well, now we're talking about instead of $53 billion, a quarter trillion. But part of that that always gets left under the table is the current infrastructure yep. mm -hmm. and the aging of that infrastructure and what do we need to do to repair that and unfortunately I think that we've kind of just left it and said don't worry about it it'll solve itself. Or again local it's communities have to find the money to That's pay for exactly. their fixes themselves. Which, which there are dollars that legislature appropriate and bonds again the water right. development board and then a loaning process and or an incentive but yeah. I, think, I think in today's world you really have to talk about incentives. I think that and, That's and, got to be the way. and yeah. different pots of money. So in other words, the state, we as state taxpayers aren't going to get the whole way. But we as county taxpayers or local communities can also help get us part way. And, right. and the reason being is, in part, that's the world we live in today. And then number two is the cost of borrowing money is so cheap. And right, so there is I'm, that. That's I'm not, I'm not an right. advocate of debt. I never have been an advocate of debt. That's the way I grew up. Yet, when it doesn't cost you much, yeah. it's almost insane. If not you're going to gonna borrow, this is the time to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, Representative, you I, also? I totally agree yeah. with Glenn. And um, you know, we have the mechanisms for any of the entities to go and uh, borrow money and, and the programs out there to do wastewater, drinking water improvements and such, but until that, that price tag on them gets to where it's, it, they're catching so much heat or they're, it's cost them so much money, then they're not doing it. Uh, so incentives, um, yeah, that, that's the way to look at it, say we're doing because where's Carolyn? What, what is about $220 billion worth of Infrastructure needed for um, to update all our facilities. All of them. Okay. Yeah. And um, um, in one day, it's sometime it's going to have to be done. Right. Gonna, and and that's, that's the cost today. That's correct. The that's cost right. tomorrow, and the economy comes back, everything that's recovers, right. and the cost of borrowing money gets more expensive. Suddenly, our options may be more limited. But there may be different pots that can use those dollars. Is in, my point. It's not just all state. Not trying to pass it off to locals. That's right. not. But. But we have to figure out ways to do that right. together. Although some of, that, some of that is inevitable, I suspect. Yeah.